I want you to look at this line. In the middle, you can see a blue dot. On one end, a yellow dot. On the other end, a green dot. Now, I want to ask you a very simple question. Is the blue dot closer to the yellow one or to the green one? Most people will say that the blue dot is closer to the yellow one. Heck, I've seen this a million times and it still looks closer to the yellow dot to me. In fact, however, once we take away the arrowheads, you can see that the blue dot is actually smack bang in the middle. Still not convinced? Look, if we remove the dots and stack the lines one above the other, they're exactly the same length. This is called the Muller-Lea illusion. And what it shows is that brains are weird. What people see and what they believe they see may be entirely different. And it's not just in optical illusions that this is true. When witnesses come to court, even witnesses who've seen exactly the same thing from exactly the same perspective, they will often describe different things. Brains are weird. Witnesses are even weirder. G'day everyone, my name's Anthony Maranac and welcome to the third and final video in Module 4 of our Introduction to Law. This video is all about evidence. Now you'll need to study a whole course on evidence later in your degree. It's one of those priestly 11 subjects that everyone must do in order to practice law. The thing is, evidence is quite a complicated subject and most people do it in their final year. To me, that's a bit late to be learning about evidence because our IRAC method of legal reasoning only makes sense if we have facts. We can't apply the law to the facts unless there are facts. In most of your subjects, you will be given the facts as part of any problem question you might be asked to answer. But out there in the real world, facts are established using evidence law. So a general understanding of evidence law right up front will help you to understand where the facts come from and how they get to court. The first thing I want to do is distinguish between three different concepts, facts, information and evidence. They kind of sound like they should mean the same thing, right? Well, they nearly do. I want you to imagine a car crash for a moment, a big mangled mess on the side of the road. The facts describe everything that you could possibly know about that collision. Everything from the types of the cars, their precise speed, the engine temperature, oil pressure, tyre pressure, the mass of the vehicles including the passengers and fuel, the air temperature and pressure, the friction coefficient of the road, the exact position of the sun, the exact camber of the road, the intelligence of each driver, the precise amount of attention they were paying to the road, their level of driving experience, all of this right down to the most precise level of detail. All of those things are facts. Let me tell you, in the law, you never have all the facts. For one thing, there are just too many facts. No witnesses could notice them all and no instruments will measure them all. Witnesses will notice what they think is important and investigators will measure what they believe to be important. But any fact which is not observed or not measured will be completely lost thereafter. The things which are measured or which are observed become information. So you can see that the information about an incident is a subset of the facts. The information represents the facts that have been observed and which can then be described. For criminal matters, the role of the police will be to obtain as much information as they can about the incident. In civil matters, you will work with your client to obtain as much information as you can. Evidence represents those bits of the information which can be brought before the court. You see, not all information will be able to be brought before the court. Some information might be obtained second or third hand. Some information might be obtained covertly in ways that the court wouldn't accept. 
Some information might be based on opinions. Some information might even be obtained unlawfully as a result of threats or pressure. The court has a whole system of rules which limit the information that can be placed in front of the court. So while information is a subset of the facts, evidence is a subset of the information. The facts are everything we could know. Information is everything we do know. Evidence is everything we can show the court. So how then does the court decide what information it will receive and what information it will ignore? There are three basic types of evidence. There's oral evidence, documentary evidence, and real evidence. Oral evidence, you'll be surprised to learn, is evidence given orally. It's evidence given by a witness in the courtroom under an oath to tell the truth. And this is the stuff of which courtroom dramas are made. Oral evidence has a couple of key features. First, oral evidence in the common law system is given viva voce. What that means is it's given in question and answer format. The role of the witness is to answer questions from the lawyers and sometimes from the judges. The witnesses are not allowed to just get up and make a speech. Second, witnesses can only give evidence about things that they themselves have detected with their own five senses. So things that they have seen, things that they have heard, things that they have touched, things that they have smelt, and things that they have tasted. In most cases, there are three stages to the examination of witnesses giving oral evidence. There's the evidence in chief, where the witness is questioned by the lawyer who has called them as a witness. Now, during the evidence in chief, the questioner is only allowed to ask what are called open questions. Those are questions beginning with who, what, where, when, how and why. So basically, the idea is that during their evidence in chief, the witness will tell their story with as little prompting as possible from the lawyer. Next comes the cross-examination. Cross-examination is undertaken by the side that did not call the witness. During cross-examination, the lawyer will do their best to put the witness under pressure. And they can do this by asking closed questions or leading questions where the answer is suggested by the question itself. Let me show you the difference. An open question used in examination in chief might be, what did you do when you arrived at the shopping centre? A leading question used in cross-examination on the same point might be, when you arrived at the shopping centre, you went straight to the jewellery store, didn't you? Can you see how the second question suggests the answer, while the first question does not? Cross-examination using leading questions has two basic types. Questions testing the witness's actual evidence and questions testing the witness's credibility. So a question testing the witness's evidence might be the car you saw driving away from the scene was actually blue, not red, isn't that so? Whereas a question testing the witness's credibility might be you have a long-standing hatred of the defendant, don't you? Can you see the difference? The first question suggests to the court that the witness has just got it wrong. The second type of question suggests to the court that the witness can't be believed. Now, once the cross-examination is complete, the third part of the process is called re-examination. During re-examination, we go back to the party that called the witness and they can ask questions which might help to clarify answers that were given in cross-examination. They're still restricted to open questions and they can only ask about stuff that was considered in cross-examination. The idea is not to allow the witness to give fresh evidence at this point, but rather to give the witness an opportunity to clarify any ambiguities in the evidence they've just given. Quite often there is no re-examination or it'll be only one or two questions long. Oral evidence 
is traditionally regarded as the gold standard of evidence because uniquely a witness can answer questions. A document can't and a physical exhibit can't. However, at the same time, oral evidence is subject to a number of inherent limitations. First, oral evidence is subject to the limitation of perception. That's the whole point of the Muller-Lear illusion that we saw earlier. Six different people might see the same thing from different vantage points and they might give different evidence about what they actually saw. People also have different levels of skill at things like estimating distance and speed. Second, oral evidence is subject to limitations of comprehension. I mean, sometimes it takes special knowledge to understand quite what you're seeing. For instance, imagine you saw someone holding a firearm. Those who knew nothing about firearms might say that the person with the firearm was clearly about to shoot someone. Someone who does know about firearms, though, would be looking at other things first. Is the person with the firearm exercising trigger discipline? That is, do they have their finger on the trigger or outside the trigger guard? Does the firearm have a magazine in it? Is the safety catch applied? They simply know more things to look for. Third, oral evidence is subject to the limitations of memory. Our memories are imperfect and memory skills vary from person to person. Mine can be terrible sometimes. This is perfectly normal. And it's also normal for trials to take place quite some time after the events being considered in the trial. The result is that witnesses will struggle to remember just exactly what happened. Finally, oral evidence is subject to the limits of honesty. Some people will quite deliberately give dishonest evidence, even under oath. But even people who are not being dishonest, they may still spin events in a way that makes them look a little better, or ways that make the defendants look a little worse. There are two other types of evidence. They also both have advantages and limitations. Let's look next at documentary evidence. Documentary evidence obviously is evidence in the form of a document. But what's a document? Obviously, a piece of paper with writing on it is a document. But there are many other types of document. A photograph is a document. A text message is a document. A painting is a document. A t-shirt with a slogan on the front could be a document. A bumper sticker on a car is a document. A DVD is a document. A USB drive is a document. An old-fashioned pianola reel is a document. Anything from which data can be extracted or read with or without the use of a machine is a document. Now one major advantage of documents is that they don't tend to degrade over time. A photograph of a blood stain will still look the same three years later, long after the blood stain itself is gone and long after the memory of witnesses ceases to really be reliable. There are some disadvantages to documents though. The first and most obvious is that the document itself can't be cross-examined. So in order to let the other party test the evidence, the document has to be brought into court by a witness who's prepared to authenticate the document and answer questions about it. So if the document is a text message, then you'd need to bring the person who sent that message, or perhaps the person who received it. If the document was a photograph, you'd need to bring in the person who took the photo. The second thing is that documents are not inherently trustworthy. And you need to be careful to check any presumption you might have about their reliability. For instance, imagine a photo taken around about 6pm, just on dusk. There are so many filters nowadays that you can brighten that photo and make it look like pure daylight. That might make a real difference in a case. I mean, it's not unknown for people to completely fake documents. So don't go falling for the idea that documents themselves are inherently superior. They need to be authenticated. And that authenticating witness 
may in fact be the key to showing that the document is not quite what it was cracked up to be. Finally, there's real evidence. Real evidence is really there. It's actually in the courtroom. There are a number of types of real evidence. First, there's exhibits. Exhibits are actual items that are brought, in, brought into the courtroom. So for instance, a murder weapon, or the clothes being worn by the victim, or the jewellery that was stolen. Exhibits are actually not all that common in most cases because the information contained in an exhibit is quite often not contested. So for instance, if the allegation was that the defendant stabbed the victim with a knife, and the defendant was saying that they did indeed stab the victim with a knife, but it was self-defence. Well, there's no need to bring the knife in. Exhibits can easily be confused with documents because, after all, documents are things, aren't they? What you have to think about is whether the item itself is the evidence or whether the data on the item is the evidence. If somebody steals my phone, then at their trial, the phone would be the real evidence because nobody's interested in what's on the phone. They're only interested in the phone itself as an object that got stolen. However, if I was charged with stalking, then the photos and messages on my phone are more likely to be the actual point. So that means we're dealing with documentary evidence. See the difference? Now, the second type of real evidence is called a courtroom demonstration. I don't like these, I think they're usually just cheap theatre. A courtroom demonstration occurs when some part of the evidence is reenacted in the courtroom. Really though, how can one possibly have any confidence that the reenactment looks anything like the original event? The only sort of courtroom demonstration I personally can see as being helpful is where a witness who is giving oral evidence might be asked, for instance, to reproduce a gesture that they or the other party used during a conversation. Beyond that, it's hard to see a lot of value in courtroom demonstrations. A third type of real evidence is what's called a view. This is where the court itself travels to some location which was part of the events on trial. So for instance, the scene of the alleged crime or the place in which a body or some evidence was located. Now there's some controversy about whether views are in fact evidence or whether they just help the court to understand the evidence. Views are a bit of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, actually being there really may enable people to have greater insights. On the other hand, things may have changed since the day of the event. Basic environmental conditions like whether it's sunny or cloudy, or what time of day it was, that might have changed too. Plants grow, trees get cut down, the human built environment changes. So there are limits to how confident we can be that the current scene represents the scene at the relevant time. The final type of real evidence is the demeanour and appearance of witnesses in the courtroom. So for instance, if there's a witness who's said to have run from one place to another, and that witness is very frail and barely able to walk, it's reasonable for the jury to consider that. Again, though, there are some problems. For one thing, this may lead to people being judged on their appearance. Someone who has a bad case of bogan tattoos might not get a fair trial. Someone who has a distinctively Aboriginal appearance might not get a fair trial. Second again, things might change. The witness who was supposed to have run from place to place, well they might barely be able to walk today, but that might be because they'd ran a marathon yesterday. We can't really stop juries from forming their own impressions of the defendant or the witnesses, but it's difficult in some ways to see how that process actually assists justice. So those are our types of evidence, oral evidence, documentary evidence and real evidence. Now let's think about the rules the court will apply when someone tries to put evidence forward in a case. These rules can be really complicated, which is why evidence is usually an advanced subject. At their simplest though, they can be reduced to one acronym, R-A-R-P. Is the evidence relevant? Is the evidence admissible? Is the evidence reliable? And what is the probative value of the evidence? 
Let's look at each of those in turn. The first question the court will consider is whether the evidence is even relevant. Relevance means that the evidence must be logically capable of affecting the likelihood that a fact in issue is more or less true. Let's break that down into two sub-issues. The first, there has to be some logical connection between the evidence and the likelihood that some fact is more or less true. So if the evidence is that the defendant was running away from the scene, well then CCTV footage would be relevant if it shows him running. Witness statements about him running or not running would be relevant. An IQ test showing his level of intelligence would not be relevant because the IQ test can't tell you anything about whether he was running or not. Second, to be relevant, evidence has to be regarding a fact in issue. So let's say a person is charged with doing 75 in a 60 zone. And let's say their defence is it's not a 60 zone, it's actually an 80 zone. Can you see that in that case, the speed of the car is actually not an issue? Everyone agrees the car was doing 75. The issue is whether it was a 60 zone or an 80 zone. So the evidence about the speed of the car is not relevant. Any evidence that is not relevant will not be considered by the court and it should not be heard by the jury. If the evidence is relevant, however, then the next thing to consider is whether it is admissible. You see, there's a heap of rules about the sort of evidence that the court will and will not consider. These developed over time according to the common law, although in many jurisdictions they've now been written into statute. These rules frustrate many members of the public because they want to know why evidence that is relevant is kept away from the jury. Well, it's kept away from the jury to preserve justice because these rules really are important. Let's think about a couple. The first one is that you usually can't rely on what's called hearsay evidence. That's where a witness gives evidence not of something they observed, but instead evidence of what someone else told the witness about. So if a witness says, I saw him crash his car into the shop, well, that's fine, that's direct evidence. But if the witness says, I know he crashed the car into the shop because my friend Danielle saw it. That's not fine. It's hearsay and it won't be allowed. Although there are some exceptions, like if one person confesses to another. A second admissibility rule relates to the character or the history of the defendant. Now this one really does upset a lot of people. You see, the criminal history of a defendant must not be made known to the jury. People in the public say, but that's crazy. Surely the jury should know if the defendant has previously been jailed three times for this sort of offending. Well, no. The fact that a person has been convicted of similar offences in the past actually tells us nothing unless there's some signature aspect of the crime that links the two. And that happens very rarely. Most of the time, the jury will know nothing about any earlier offending. The defendant must be tried on the evidence of this crime, not some previous one. A third admissibility rule is called the opinion rule. Witnesses are not allowed to just give their opinions about things. It's not Facebook. They can give evidence of what they saw, but it's up to the jury to decide what that evidence means. It's not up to the witness to say what that evidence means. So the witness might say, he arrived at work looking quite dishevelled and with red eyes. He then sat with his head on his desk for half an hour drinking Barocca. All of those things can be observed. The witness can't, however, go on and say he was hung over. That's for the jury to decide. There is one type of opinion evidence that's allowed and that's what we call expert opinion evidence. That happens when the court allows parties to call in an expert who has expertise that the court does not have. They might be a doctor or a DNA analyst or a fingerprint expert or a handwriting expert or a botanist or an indigenous tracker. Those experts who almost certainly didn't witness anything about the crime itself or the dispute itself, they'll be able to contribute their expertise. There are a bunch of laws about how they do this. And we don't really need to worry about those just yet. 
So let's say that a piece of evidence is relevant and it's admissible because it's not hearsay, it's not about the character or history of the defendant and it's not opinion. Well, at this point, the court is going to accept the evidence. But that's not the end of the story. The next thing we need to do is think about what this evidence is going to actually contribute. To do that, we ask two further questions. First, we ask, is the evidence reliable? Evidence can be unreliable for a number of reasons. We've already mentioned the fact that oral evidence is subject to a number of limitations, and those limitations can make the evidence unreliable. For instance, let's say a criminal offence occurs in a nightclub. Our witness says that they heard the defendant say to the victim quite calmly, come outside or I will stab you. Well, this witness may be telling the absolute truth as they remember it, but there are some reliability problems here. First, nightclubs tend to be very loud. Isn't it possible the witness thought they heard the defendant say that, but in fact the defendant said something else? Or someone else said those words? Second, nightclubs tend to be dark with confusing and ever-changing lighting. Can the witness really be sure that it was the defendant they saw at that moment? Third, nightclubs tend to be places where people consume alcohol, often in large quantities. Was the witness intoxicated? If they were, then that would surely affect the reliability of what they'd seen. A second key reason why evidence might be unreliable relates to the witnesses themselves. The witness might, for instance, have a history of lying to police. They might have made other statements outside the court that contradict their current evidence. There might be other evidence tending to show that they've been threatened or offered a reward relating to their evidence. They might be so close to the defendant that it would be difficult or impossible for them to give impartial evidence. In trials, lawyers will spend a lot of time trying to show the jury that the evidence brought forward by the other side is, for one reason or another, unreliable. The final question we must ask about evidence is, what does this actually prove? Let's think about a situation where a defendant is said to have driven away from the scene in a red Hyundai. The prosecution is seeking to tender as evidence the defendant's driver's licence. Is it relevant? Well, having a driver's licence is quite closely associated with driving, I'd say that's relevant. Is it admissible? It's a document, so it would need someone to authenticate it, but that's the only real problem I can see with admissibility. Is it reliable? Sure is. No one's suggesting that it's a fake driver's licence. But once it's cleared all of these hurdles, what does it actually prove? I'm going to go ahead and say it proves nothing. Just because the accused has a driver's licence doesn't tell us the accused was driving the red Hyundai. Plenty of people have licences but don't drive getaway cars. And frankly, plenty of people don't have licences but they hit the road anyway. So can you see that the probative value of this evidence, its value as proof, is very low. Whereas if the driver had uploaded YouTube footage of themselves taken from inside the car with a GoPro, time stamped, and you see Hyundai written on the steering wheel and you can see the red colour of the wing mirrors, well that evidence is going to have massive probative value if what you're trying to prove is that the defendant was driving that getaway car. So you can see not all evidence has the same probative value. At this stage of your degree, what I really want you to remember is that in the real world, facts don't just fall from the sky the way they do in university problem questions. Facts come from evidence, oral evidence, documentary evidence, and real evidence. And in relation to each piece of evidence, we ask, is it relevant? Is it admissible? Is it reliable? And what does it prove? All right, let's wrap up module four. In the first part of this module, we learned about the IRAC model for legal reasoning. This is our fundamental model for legal reasoning in every area of law, from the first year of uni to the High Court of Australia. We look at the facts and determine the issues. We do our research and identify the rule. We apply the facts of the case to that rule and we conclude with a legally sound advice for our client. In the second video, we looked at the process of advocacy, because in a real dispute, IRAC is great, but the other side have got their own IRAC, 
resulting in very different conclusions. Advocacy is how you prove to your opponents or to the court that your case is the stronger one. One thing that will help with your advocacy is obviously evidence. The party whose IRAC argument is backed up by evidence which is relevant, admissible, reliable and has high probative value, well that's the party that's going to win the case. In the final module of our introduction to law, we're going to be looking at the law in the real world. That is, we're going to be looking at a series of different types of people to consider what their experience of the law is like. We'll look at members of the legal profession. We'll look at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. We'll look at women. And we'll look at lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex Australians. We're on the home stretch now. See you in Module 5.